When England declared war on Germany on the 3rd of August, 1914, His Majesty owned only four practical airships. Personnel consisted of 13 officers and 182 men, divided between two bases, Farnborough and the partly completed Kingstar. His Majesty's Airship No. 4, actually a German Parseval, made the first wartime air patrol the next day. At sea, the movement of a rising line of leaking oil inevitably gave away the position of a submarine to an airship hovering overhead. The French Army Airship Fleurus made the war's first air raid on an enemy position on the 23rd of August. Since aerial bombs had not been invented, the crew dropped artillery shells on the territory of Cons Cartaus. The German Navy possessed only one Zeppelin, the L3, and a few non-rigid marine Luftschiffe. When the war was one month old, the submarine U-21 successfully torpedoed His Majesty's ship Pathfinder. The cruiser's magazine exploded, and the ship sank in four minutes, taking 259 of her crew with her. It was the only combat victory of a submarine since the American Civil War, and the first ever against a moving target. On the 22nd of September, the older, kerosene-powered U-9, under command of Captain Lieutenant Otto von Wedekin, sank the British light cruisers Abacur, Hogue, and Cressy. The loss of 1,460 lives in less than one hour was a rude awakening to a single submarine's true capabilities. On the 3rd of November, the British responded, beginning a massive mining effort across the North Sea. Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, treated the whole of Germany as if it were a beleaguered fortress and avowedly sought to starve the whole population, men, women and children, old and young, wounded and sound, into submission. The Germans retaliated with the first Zeppelin bombing raid over England on the 19th of January, 1915. On the 28th of February, the British Navy's first sea lord, Jackie Fisher, called an emergency meeting to find a small, fast, and cheap airship to operate against the U-boats. The Royal Aircraft Factory had suggested simply hanging a standard BE-2C airplane fuselage under the old Willows envelope. In just three weeks' time, the first SS, Submarine Scout, airship was rolled out. Lord Fisher's approval was brisk. Now I must have 40, even though everyone thinks I'm mad. From the first one to fly that March, a second type quickly followed, based on the Armstrong Whitworth airplane fuselage. Yet a third SS type would be created with the Maurice Farman pusher style fuselage. They were employed as convoy escorts. In April 1915, the American Navy awarded a contract for its first airship to the Connecticut Aircraft Company, envisioning a fleet of dirigibles would soon be aloft. Former showman Tom Baldwin, then over 60 years old, would help out. But that month, bottled up by the British minefield, Germany declared its submarines would sink any vessel in the war zone without warning. The American tanker, Gulf Flight, was torpedoed off the Scilly Islands on the 2nd of May with three American lives lost. The next day, the British submarine D-4 was damaged by the Zeppelin L-5 under Capitan Lieutenant Heinrich Matte. On the 7th, the U-20 under Capitan Lieutenant Walter Schwager fired a single torpedo in the liner Lusitania. Secondary explosions sank her in 18 minutes. 1,198 people were killed. During the uproar over the 124 Americans lost, Secretary of State William Jennings Bryan revealed that over 5,000 cases of ammunition were aboard the armed liner. On the 11th of May, Zeppelin L-9 came across four British submarines, which opened fire on the scout. The airship dropped bombs. Both sides thought they had damaged the other, but all lived to fight another day. When war reached the Adriatic, there were four Italian airship bases, including two for naval airships. The Italians entered the war on the 23rd of May, 1915, and three days later, Italian airshipmen crossed the Adriatic to attack Sabenico. Eight days later, London suffered its first Zeppelin raid following French bombing attacks on German cities. On the 8th of June, the Italian airship Citi di Ferrara bombed Timi, but was shot up by an Austro-Hungarian float plane over the Gulf of Carnaro near Lucino. Two Italians died. The airship commander, another officer, and five crewmen spent the rest of the war as prisoners. The wrecked airship was taken into Pola Harbor for display. 
Some Italian airships would be used to hunt submarines in the Mediterranean, but most wound up shadowing land held by Austria-Hungary. Days later, a British airplane bombed Zeppelin LZ-37 to destruction, the first combat loss of a rigid airship. Ironically, both victorious airplane pilots would later die in airplane crashes. Between May and November 1915, the Italian Navy flew 14 sorties with airships P-4, M-2, and V-1. On the 5th of August, the airship named for the city of Gizi was lost to anti-aircraft fire. Austrian seaplanes bombed the Italian airships at their bases in Gizi and Ferrara. The Germans' old Gross Bassenach M-4 attacked a British submarine in the fall of 1915, and the third wooden-framed Schutte Lanz airship attacked the Royal Navy submarine E-4. All lived to fight again. On the last day of the year, a U-boat torpedoed the British liner Persia off Crete. 335 souls aboard were lost, including the American consul. In all of 1915, only 19 new boats had been put out of action, while 52 new had been built. But by then, just 10 months after Admiral Fisher ordered their construction, a total of 29 submarine scout airships were in service, providing air cover for ships passing through the waters around Britain. Suddenly embracing airships, the French Navy purchased the SS-21, SS-26, SS-48, and SS-49, employing them for anti-submarine patrols. On one patrol, the SS-48 got into trouble and was assisted by a French submarine. The French Army airship Alsace was struck by a German shell and had been forced to land behind the enemy's lines in October 1916. Her crew was imprisoned as the victorious Germans examined their prize. In January 1916, the American submarine E-2 was the victim of a violent explosion when battery hydrogen, trapped inside, was ignited by a spark. Four men were killed and seven were injured. Recovering from this tragedy, the first U.S. submarine to cross the Atlantic did so with diesel power later that year. A submarine scout established a record altitude of 10,300 feet in the summer of 1916. One SS, Maurice Farman, fitted with a Hawk engine, carried out a single patrol of 18 hours, 20 minutes. Two voyages to neutral America by the mercantile submarine Deutschland, along with the sudden appearance of the military submarine U-53 outside Newport, Rhode Island in 1916, had delivered a veiled warning that American waters would not be immune to European submarines. Desire to progress beyond faltering individual efforts by the U.S. Army and Navy to form an unusual alliance. The Joint Army-Navy Airship Board tasked the Aluminum Company of America to duplicate the strong, lightweight alloy used in Zeppelins. Meanwhile, the Navy's lowest bidder struggled to complete its first airship. The dirigible non-rigid one, built by Connecticut Aircraft, would have to be erected in a National Guard armory. A specially designed floating hangar for it was built at Pensacola, Florida. The DN-1 would later emerge for a few unimpressive flights. Returning home from England, American Lieutenant John Towers told of seeing the small dirigibles the British called blimps. He suggested that the American Navy build a similar airship. The overcomplicated DN-1 was scrapped. On March 24th, the French passenger ferry Sussex was torpedoed, killing 50 people. President Woodrow Wilson threatened to break diplomatic relations with Germany. On May 14th, Germany issued the so-called Sussex Pledge, promising no more passenger ships would be attacked without warning. Back in England, the new pusher-style SSZ airships gave three-man crews a more comfortable, boat-like car, instead of an adapted airplane fuselage. A 100-horsepower, water-cooled engine drove a four-bladed propeller to push the 70,000 cubic foot ship through the air. The gasoline was carried in aluminum tanks attached by fabric slings to the envelope. In all, 77 SSZ airships would be built. The inexpensive airship's growing numbers were eventually supported by some 60 bases around the United Kingdom. France would purchase two of these advanced SSZ airships, the 21 and 22. Lessons had been learned from the SS ship built on the pusher airplane body. The forward cockpit offered excellent visibility and a clear gun firing arc. The radio operator was seated amidships, and the engine mechanic had good access to the engine, whose fumes and hot exhaust were well behind the crew. Engine magnetos were a constant problem. 
since they could no longer be obtained from Bosch in Germany. English-built magnetos often had to be changed in flight, sometimes with mechanics standing, freezing on the handrails all the way back to base. Taking over the remaining eight Army airships, the French Navy operated from four airship bases on coastal patrols from the Channel South, soon establishing a base in Bizerta in northern Africa. France would purchase two of the advanced SSZ airships, the 21 and 22. Later on, the twin-engined SS twin airship design increased reliability. 100,000 cubic feet of hydrogen lifted the wider SST car, built to carry five crewmen ahead of its pusher propellers. To create an even more capable airship, two Avro seaplane bodies were joined and hung under an Astra Torres design envelope of 170,000 cubic feet. This new coastal or C-class airship could carry larger bombs on long-duration patrols. The coastal featured a machine gun post atop the hull, accessible by ladder in a sleeve through the envelope. Air Marshal Sir Thomas Elmhurst remembered his first night flight in the C-19. On looking astern, I saw all manner of red-hot bits from the engine exhaust carried back under the gas bag to the big gas valve right aft, which occasionally opened and released inflammable hydrogen. Also, we were not very keen on flying in thunderstorms. The ship became well charged up with electricity, and on one occasion I can remember seeing sparks flicking between the six wires controlling the big gas valves along my right shoulder. C-1 successfully tested being towed from a surface ship. She performed underway refueling and crew interchange with HMS Canterbury that September. At 12 knot speed, the airship was brought to the deck for the crew interchange, also accomplished with a bosun's chair from 100 feet. 60 gallons of fuel was fed up a hose to the airship with compressed air in a mere eight minutes. The British also would develop the Sea Star, an improved coastal airship with larger engines. One coastal was sold to France. The French Navy designated that ship AT-0, taking its place with the SS and SSZ airships. Additional French bases were created as their air fleet expanded to 25 airships. The firm of Astra Torres produced the impressive new AT series airship. AT ships carried a 75mm gun with a clear view ahead. The AT featured a helmsman forward whose wheel controlled the rudder and an elevator man aft to his right to control the airship's height. The airship commander was in the center compartment. Like the Coastal, the ATs featured a top-mounted gun platform to guard against airplane attack. German fighter ace Oswald Belka, who had shot down 40 airplanes, attacked an Astra Torres airship but was unable to bring it down. An intensive building program produced more than a dozen of these high-endurance AT airships. AT-11 completed a mission of more than 37 hours. Innovative flyers used a plate on the engine's exhaust as a cook plate to make hot meals on long patrols. The depth charge was introduced late in 1916. It was nothing more than an industrial drum filled with explosives and fitted with a pressure-sensitive detonator that caused the device to burst at a predetermined depth underwater. With the situation worsening at sea, the French Navy assumed control of all Army airships in March 1917. Less than two weeks after, the United States Admiral of the Navy, George Dewey, died in office. Secretary of the Navy, Josephus Daniels, approved construction of a single prototype airship. Following the British example, the new dirigible, non-rigid or DN, would be constructed using a Curtis airplane fuselage. In February 1917, Germany rescinded the Sussex Pledge and reinstated unrestricted warfare on merchant shipping in an attempt to blockade England. On the 12th, the C-22 scored a direct hit on a U-boat, but the bomb failed to detonate. The U-boat escaped a second bomb. The same month, the C-9 and surface units attacked a submarine which yielded floating wreckage. By the spring of 1917, nearly one quarter of all ships leaving England did not return. It came down to the six-month calculation. Unless stopped, the U-boats would have the Allies starved by November. 444 ships, totaling about 900,000 gross tons, were sunk by U-boats during April. On the 23rd of April, the crew of Germany's L-23 stopped the Norwegian schooner Royal at sea, boarded it, and a prize crew sailed her to a German port. The tables were turned when the German Zeppelin L-49 absorbed incendiary bullets only to fall exhausted onto French territory. Firing flares directly into the gas cells, 
the airship's crew could not get L-49 to ignite in time before French soldiers captured them. Poring over the prize for secrets of her construction, the victorious French made detailed plans. The plans were shared with the Allies. The Americans would later build a rigid airship modeled from the plans of the L-49. Production for the French Navy was expanded as the firms of Chalet Moudon and Zodiac turned out new and more capable airships. The torpedo-shaped Chalet Moudon T-series cars featured inboard, air-cooled radial engines turning outboard propellers. The arrangement allowed the mechanic to work on the engines without hanging outboard. The advanced design supported larger envelopes for greater loads and endurance, and the sleek cars were heavily armed. The smaller Zodiac V series also featured airplane radial engines, but turning long prop shafts outboard. The V series took their place alongside the larger airships at an expanding number of French airship bases. The success of the German rigid airship had revitalized efforts toward a British rigid that had been stopped a second time. As an interim measure, the giant non-rigid North Sea class was conceived. The 360,000 cubic foot hydrogen envelope was pushed to 55 miles per hour by two Rolls-Royce 250 horsepower engines. The cabin could accommodate two crews and the ships would set new endurance records. British Air Vice Marshal P.E. Maitland later recalled his early service with the North Sea airships. During the remainder of May, we were very busy with patrols without due incident, except that during a very heavy thunderstorm, we noticed sparks some five inches long jumping across our control wires. We wondered why the long lengths of wire inside the envelope did not produce a similar discharge, and as the hydrogen was highly inflammable, we were thankful that apparently they did not. On the 7th of May, the NS-3 dropped new 130-pound bombs on what was later shown to be a wreck. The expanding Allied lighter-than-air forces employed increasing numbers of young men in the long-duration work that was airship flying. The countless hours of searching in vain for a submarine were rarely rewarded because the boat could see the airship coming a long way off. Airshipmen logged endless miles escorting convoys over large areas off the coasts expanding into the Mediterranean. Traffic was logged suspicious objects investigated, and mines reported for disposal. It was not unusual for blimp men to be asked to look for traces of airplanes that never returned. Thousands starved, the frustrated Germans attempted to entice Mexico to invade the United States in exchange for returning Mexican territory lost in the Mexican-American War. Word reached Washington. It was the last straw. President Wilson ended relations with Germany and stated war was inevitable. U.S. Navy Secretary Daniels ordered 16 new single-engine airships without even testing a prototype. Contracts were placed in March for nine from Goodyear, five from Goodrich, and two from Connecticut Aircraft. The Chicago shed that had been home to the old rubber cows became home to dirigible, non-rigid assembly. The first airship left Chicago on the 24th of May, 1917, making a record distance flight to Ohio. Several of the one-time exhibition balloonists went to work on the airship effort. Tom Baldwin became an inspector at Goodyear, and Roy Kanabachu became a test pilot at Goodrich. The Bode factory engineer, Henri Julio, had come to America to join Goodrich. Leo Stevens became an Army aeronautics instructor. The Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company of Akron had already started construction of a hangar and hydrogen generator at Wingfoot Lake, Ohio. The Navy made a contract with Goodyear to train 20 men in ballooning and the operation of the coming dirigibles. The new Scout dirigible, still designated DN-2, remained at Wingfoot for the next few months as the first naval airship detachment under Navy Commander L.H. Maxfield was trained. American expertise and resolve would soon be tested. Music